are some of the major takeaways from the summit between Chinese President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden in California. Could the meeting be a turning point for the China-U.S. relationship? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu in San Francisco and welcome to a special edition of The Heat. The Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation meetings continue here in San Francisco, where leaders and CEOs from across the APEC economies have gathered this week. A major talking point continues to be reaction to the meeting on Wednesday between Chinese President Xi and U.S. President Biden. I will get more reaction to that in a few moments from our distinguished panel. But for more on President Xi's participation on Thursday and what we can expect for the rest of his visit, joining me now is CGTN correspondent Hendrik Sebrande. Hendrik, great to have you with us. Uh, let's start with the CEO summit. This was a highly anticipated address by the Chinese president to top business leaders in the United States. It really paves the way. It's the roadmap uh, in very broad strokes on how China would like to engage with the business world. Uh, definitely with an economic perspective. Mm -hmm. It reminded me a lot of like a, a, a state of the state speech that you would have in one of the U.S. states that a governor would give or a state of the union for the president, but were, with a definite business focus. And this is what he was striving for. Obviously, China is trying to beef up its uh, investment opportunities, have more and more companies come to China now to uh, invest um, money and get businesses growing there. Uh, countries around the world in the wake of uh, COVID-19 and the wake of inflation. It's been a, a difficult period the last couple of years. So he's trying to rejuvenate economic prospects uh, at home as much as he possibly can. He said uh, from the speech, he said the world has entered a new period of turbulence and change. He said the momentum of world economic growth is sluggish. So kind of echoing that point. Um, he sort of laid out the ways that he's trying uh, to make China easier for businesses to operate in that country. He said things like, you know, we'll continue to improve the mechanisms for protecting the rights and interests of foreign investors. We'll strive to tear down the barriers to the flow of innovation factors, uh, improve the policy on entry and stay of foreign nationals in China, uh, all to make it easier for foreign companies to invest and operate in the country. So it's, it's his I guess uh, his pitch to uh, business executives and companies around the globe to consider doing business there. Um, clearly, we're in a new paradigm after COVID-19. Uh, the world economy is, as he said, still uh, having some, some issues and difficulties, but that shouldn't stop companies from considering moving their businesses and investing more heavily there if they can. I want to just get back for a moment to that meeting uh, between uh, President Xi and President Biden, face-to-face -face meeting, very high-level summit. Uh, we're still getting reaction to that. Generally, uh, we're hearing very positive comments about that. Uh, we looked at, you know, the meeting took place, then they had lunch, of course, then they went for a walk in the park. Uh, and as you pointed out, the atmospherics look good. Atmospherics look good. The optics are always very important in this kind of diplomacy between two high-ranking leaders. Obviously, the world is looking to the U.S. and China to kind of set the tone for how things are run and, and what kind of climate we have. Uh, I'm not just talking climate as in climate change, yeah. but climate uh, writ large. Mm -hmm. And so it, just initially, it seemed like the, the chemistry between the two leaders was good. They've known each other for quite a long time. Uh, and they covered a range of topics. They talked about a lot of different issues. Um, you know, they looked like they reached agreement on things like fentanyl, uh, on military to military communication. Fentanyl is a big issue in the U.S. And whatever uh, the U.S. can do to get China to help stem the flow of these chemicals to the U.S. Uh, to stop the, uh, the fentanyl scourge or at least slow it down would be helpful. Military to military communication obviously is a, a positive thing if both countries can pull it off. So those are the two yeah. highlights. And of course then panda diplomacy, yeah. uh, President Xi indicating that he might be open to sending some pandas back to the U.S. after several of them, the last of the pandas, left right. for China. So we'll see about that. And briefly, uh, Henrik, um, they appear to be very much on the same page as far as the battle against climate change is concerned. Climate change is is probably one of the easier, and that's hard to say in some ways, but one of the easier areas to agree on. They do seem to be on the same page. They're looking to ramp up renewable energy as much as they can, uh, really ramp it up by the year 2030. 
bring down the use of fossil fuels, yeah. if that's at all possible. It's going to be a tough task, mm -hmm. but they seem to have, their, their visions are kind of aligned when it comes to that. Great, Hendrik. Thanks so much. Great. Hendrik Sebrande there reporting. Now, for much more on the APEC meetings, joining me now from Kuala Lumpur is Victor Gao. He is chair professor at Su Chao University. With us, too, from New York is Robert Hormatz. He is a visiting lecturer at Yale University, and he's a former U.S. Under Secretary of State. Also joining the discussion from Oregon is Yan Liang. She is a chair professor on economics at Willamette University. And from Washington, D.C., we're joined by Saurabh Gupta. He is a senior Asia-Pacific policy specialist at the Institute for China America Studies. Welcome to all of you. Victor, we now have uh, more details on the substance of what was discussed by President Xi and President Biden at that summit uh, just outside San Francisco. Xinhua, the Chinese news agency, described the meeting as, quote, positive, comprehensive, and constructive. What is your overall assessment of it? Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I think the overall judgment should be that the two countries wanted to treat each other as normal and uh, the two leaders uh, wanted to reinforce their friendship and acquaintance and uh, avoid any misjudgment uh, between China and the United States, including in the military sector, which is very important, as well as in the civilian sector. This is really very positive, not only for China and the United States, but for the rest of the world. I would say whether it is a major turning point still requires a lot of heavy lifting by both China and the United States, especially when we push into the details. But I'm very positive about the future trend of the China-US relations because the two leaders seem to agree that these two countries need to get along. Whatever problems, differences between them need to solve, uh, resolved uh, in peace. And if we proceed on that condition, then the potential for cooperation between China and the United States in multiple sectors should really be unlimited. And this will generate huge benefits for the Chinese people and the American people. This is the reason why we should be optimistic for China and the United States. And Victor, when you say the heavy lifting is still to come, uh, what are the challenges? For example, it is very encouraging that the two leaders agree that the military to military exchanges and communication should be restored. Now, allow me to take one step further. What can the two military do? I would personally be very much happy to see that the two leaders and the two governments will uh, decide to restore the mutual naval port visits to each other. After all, American ships have visited many Chinese ports, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Qingdao, etc. And these visits uh, were reciprocated by Chinese calls on many American ports. Why couldn't we think about this and lift up all the obstacles and difficulties standing in the way of such port visits exchanges? And I think if we can do this, this will really create a lot of comfort for many countries in the world, especially in where I'm physically now in Southeast Asia. I'm now in Kuala Lumpur. I'm very encouraged to see that the Prime Minister of Malaysia is very positive about the meeting between President Biden and President Xi Jinping in San Francisco. The Prime Minister of Malaysia is in San Francisco personally for the APEC meeting. He is really very representative of the overall mood in this part of the world. They do not want to choose between China and the United States. They just want to see peace prevail. And we focus on development and creating all the jobs for the people here. And I think leaders, people in other parts of the world share this overall sentiment. Let's push for greater peace between China and the United States. Robert Hormatz, the Chinese Foreign Minister, Wang Yi, he said after the meeting uh, that it was very important, this summit was very important to dispel doubts, manage differences, and expand cooperation. Um, you know, I was talking to a former Australian minister here in San Francisco a few days ago, and he said nothing beats a face-to-face -face meeting to resolve one's differences. What do you think this face-to-face -face encounter accomplished? 
Well, I think this was an excellent meeting. I think it helped uh, the leaders to convey their points of view, their perspective, and identify areas for uh, cooperation uh, between the two countries. And, and you've mentioned uh, a few of the areas already. I think that's an important starting point to um, move forward on a wide range of other issues. The other point that I think uh, it deserves attention is the excellent speech that uh, President Xi gave to the business people about um, the policies of China um, in the economic area and their goal of attracting um, more foreign investment. Um, there were a lot of American business leaders there, the chairman of Apple, for instance, and, and, and others. And I think that very positive approach that President Xi indicated will be very helpful, uh, not only to that group of powerful business leaders, but to the business community in general. And I think you'll see a follow-up there. And I think the third uh, broad issue is that in the era that President Xi pointed out, where there are issues in the global economy, the two most important countries in dealing with this, as in 2008, when we had a financial crisis, were um, China and the U.S. then, and they are China and the U.S. now. So uh, other countries, um, like Malaysia and many, many others, are very positive about the notion of uh, China and the U.S. working together bilaterally, but also uh, taking a broader leadership role in helping the global economy uh, stabilize and prosper. And I think that's very important. So I think this was an excellent meeting. Um, and I, I've been to a lot of these when I was in the government. This was certainly one of the very best. And I think President Xi's speech was outstanding and excellent. And um, and has some very positive elements there. And I'm actually planning to go to China in December, so I'm going to have a chance to talk to people about what we can do to um, to support what President Xi has uh, indicated about economic cooperation, because I think it was a big step forward and very positive for China and the U.S. So, uh, uh, Robert just mentioned that address by President Xi to business leaders here in uh, San Francisco, business leaders from across the United States. As I said earlier on, it was a highly anticipated speech by the Chinese leader. Uh, it really uh, told the business community how China will open up, how it will engage with the business community. President Xi talked about openness and exclu uh, inclusiveness uh, and that that should be the defining feature of Asia-Pacific development. He said. Uh, Countries in the region should seek common ground while shelving differences. And he said, we remain committed to pursuing development with doors open. Um, do you think these meetings have cleared the air on a number of issues? Oh, yes, absolutely. They have cleared the air on a number of issues. And I would say right from Bali onwards, all the engagements that have happened have been purposeful, you know, from June particularly, there were a lot of cabinet level meetings. They have been purposeful. The, the reason we are seeing a deliverable on fentanyl is because it was broached in June and the two sides said what they wanted from each other. And this has been a reciprocal bargain. Some, China gave something, the United States gave something. This was worked through, it has been done assiduously. The, the Sunnylands uh, climate change statement which we have, the, the two special envoys, I mean, literally every second week they were in contact with each other, if not virtually, if not, and, and sometimes in person. And remember, we've not had a joint statement between the U.S. And, 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 and China for quite a while. And here we are having a joint statement, at least among the climate envoys. We have to hark back to about 10 years ago when President Obama and President Xi put out a joint announcement on climate change and said that we are going to make the Paris Conference COP21 an important one. And at Paris thereafter the next year, we had a very successful Paris Conference on climate change. And when the two countries move together in the same direction, they can get the multilateral system with them. Two biggest emitters, one developed, one developing. It, 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 they, they, it's, it's very useful. So I think, yes, very useful progress has been made. 
I don't want to exaggerate the, the, the sort of progress because, you know, on some of the very hard issues, we, they, it's, it's been kept in a kind of a holding pattern, but they're trying to accumulate small wins while at the same time trying to shape the broader strategic context, the, the strategic principles by which the US-China relationship will proceed forward. And I think they've given reassurances to each other. So yes, I think all, on all these fronts, it, the, the meetings have been useful. And I was particularly interested by the fact that President Xi at the dinner last night spoke so much about people-to-people -people contacts, that they are the basis of where we stand today in US-China relations, the good things that have happened. And they will be the ones who will take this relationship forward. And it was an important occasion because, you know, in this day and age, it's people-to-people -people relations which has really kind of gotten cut down over the past five years mm -hmm. in the tensions with the closure of Confucius Institutes with COVID. And he was suggesting, yes, it's back to people-to-people -to -people first. We are not just about elites talking to each other. We need to locate this relationship in its people who will benefit from that, and that will be the great stabilizing source for the relationship. Right. In fact, he did say we need to build bridges and pave the road for more people-to-people -people interactions. Uh, Yang Liang, great to see you. Um, President Xi also said China will further open up its markets, make market access easier, uh, and in doing so, will make a major contribution to global growth. Um, do you think that he has put to rest many of the concerns that the international business community, particularly here in the United States, have had in so far as investing in China? Yeah, good to talk to you, Anna. And, um, I hope you and your colleagues are doing well amid this very busy but very exciting times. And so I think that's a great question. I think, you know, President Xi really delivered an uh, upbeat and also very, you know, friendly speech to the business uh, CEOs and among the, the people there, you know, CEOs of Apple, of um, Tesla, of Nike, Pfizer, you know, and a bunch of other, you know, financial uh, institutions, they're all there. Um, the reason is because, you know, they really, uh, you know, enjoy and have already benefited a lot um, from the Chinese markets. And I think, you know, President Xi has been very consistent, um, you know, from the CIE to the Belt Road Initiative uh, Forum to now uh, the speech to the CEOs. He has emphasized many, many times um, that China is uh, up to a uh, high quality opening, right? China welcomes uh, the red, uh, foreign direct investors to come to China and invest there. And as a matter of fact, many of the CEOs, um, they know their companies are highly, you know, reliant on, on the Chinese market, right? Apple derives its uh, uh, revenues, about 19% of it, from China, and Tesla, 23%, Nike, 15%, you know, and uh, Qualcomm, uh, over 60%. So I think um, these CEOs are really, um, you know, wanted to be, uh, you know, enjoying the Chinese market. They want to work with the Chinese partners. They wanted to continue to build the supply chain. But there are a lot of also geopolitical risks. Um, and, you know, therefore, I think they're still um, maybe holding a sort of wait and see attitudes at this point. Um, although there are a lot of sort of negative news about, you know, declining foreign direct investment to China. But I think that, you know, still uh, many of the investors are, uh, taking this approach, you know, taking cautious approach, uh, but still they're eyeing on the Chinese market. They're thinking, you know, how to enjoy, how to, uh, what's the best timing, what are the best sectors um, to enter into the Chinese economy. But let's not forget, you know, the U.S. investors invested $126 billion last year in China. China invested $29 billion in the U.S. And the two-way trade of the two countries reached $758 billion last year, which is a historical high. So I think, you know, despite all the political rhetorics um, that are, you know, hostile uh, before this point uh, in the past few years, I think there's really um, very vibrant uh, business connections on the ground. Um, and also I anchor, uh, echo what the previous panelists have talked about, this people-to-people -people exchanges. The people come together, share their cultures, their values, they conduct trade, they conduct uh, investments and other business commercial activities. I think those are really the backbone. Um, to stabilize the relationships between the two countries. Victor, President Xi also laid out uh, the five pillars for better bilateral ties with the United States. Can you give us an overview of the type of relationship that China would like with the United States and some of the key components that will make that possible? Thank you very much. This is probably the most important thing uh, presented by the Chinese president uh, at the uh, summit meeting in San Francisco. Fundamentally, I think what President Xi Jinping emphasized is that 
China uh, respects the United States and wants respect from the United States, these two countries need to deal with each other as equal, as normal countries, and there should be no uh, competition, especially strategic competition, meaning U.S. will have its own political system, ways of doing life. China has the right to have its own political system, likewise, and China will never impose its way of life or political system or ideology onto the United States. Neither should the United States try to impose its way of life or its way of uh, political system onto China, meaning neither China nor the United States wants to change the other side. Uh, changing China or changing the United States philosophically is a mission impossible. That lays the groundwork that China and the United States need to get along. Mm -hmm. We need to figure out a way to overcome our differences, but our diversity should be what reinforces us because we bring onto the table our strengths and weaknesses. And in many areas, we actually follow different pathways. And this actually makes the whole world more exciting. And this gives the basis and the background for China-U.S. cooperation in multiple areas. And you talked about people-to-people -people exchanges and cooperation. I understand in the United States, the people really matter the most. We, the people. Therefore, for people-to-people -people exchanges between the Chinese people on the one hand and the American people on the other hand will be crucial. I also am very delighted to see that there is references to, like, the people of China and the United States. Eventually, the Chinese yeah. people and the American people r respect each other. We can deal with each other. We can get along with each other. And on this basis, there are so many things that can happen. Uh, Mr. Uh, Hobart right. mentioned his upcoming visit to China. I do hope he will have a very successful visit, a meeting with people of all walks of life, and explore possibilities to reinforce cooperation between China and the United States. We can really generate miracles. And the better the relations are, yeah. the better will be not only the Southeast Asian region, where I'm right now today here, but also the world at large. Robert, some commentators have been speculating that this summit was more about stabilizing the relationship rather than achieving any major breakthroughs. But, I mean, do you see a lessening of tensions, perhaps a more uh, positive outlook on the way forward? I definitely see a lessening of tensions. Um, but I also see that while we can't expect all problems to be resolved, in one four-hour meeting, uh, a number of very constructive steps were taken, the military-to-military -military conversations being renewed. That's an important step. The fentanyl agreement, very important. Um, there were also a number of other things that they talked about that, that probably are not going to get a, a lot of publicity, but they helped to increase the understanding between the two countries. Another area that's very important is the U.S. and China have a long tradition of working together on medical issues. American doctors, Chinese doctors work together. If you look in American hospitals, many of them have Chinese, very well-respected Chinese doctors. So cooperating on the environment, on medical issues, on, uh, on security issues through military right. to military cooperation, these are all very positive. So I think this is both an, a, a meeting to uh, reduce tensions, but also uh, set a path forward um, that yeah. our, our ministers will have to uh, follow up on and our officials will follow up on. So it's, it's launched a very positive uh, set of steps for the next year, two, okay. three, and four, and beyond. So, Rob, I want to get back to uh, another sentiment that was expressed by President Xi, and this is more of a political nature. He reminded us that San Francisco was where the United Nations Charter was signed, and he said we should uphold the principles and purposes of that UN Charter. You know, when you listen to something like that, given that you know, we are seeing a lot of conflict in the world right now, we're seeing a lot of instability, a lot of violence and conflict, um, what does that tell us? This is a theme Mr. Uh, Mr. Xi has spoken of often, 
and that is hewing to the multilateral system, the UN-centered multilateral system. He talked of the, of, with regard to that even in the context, in the bilateral context with the Americans that, mm -hmm. hey, we're not out to displace you and this is not about competing in the system. Let's all work together, row together in the same direction in the system and the system will be better off rather than working in small group, in small groups and small blocks, et cetera. And the fact that, he, that, that San Francisco is probably the biggest event that San Francisco has hosted since the UN meeting in 1945 is this APEC meeting, is just a kind of statement of the need for a new renewal of the multilateral system. And I think it was, yeah. it, 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 it was a sentiment which was well expressed. And talking, if I may just digress a little bit in terms of crisis management out here, which is, of course, it's important both yeah. at the multilateral level but also the bilateral level. I think one of the right. very, very important takeaways from the summit, which was not in the, any of the readouts, but if one had to read Mr. Mr. Biden's press conference, he said, I have known Mr. Okay. Xi Long. He is a man of his word. And Mr. Xi has said that if I call him, on okay, a crisis Sarah, management call, I will pick up the phone, and I think that's very important. Yeah. Okay, Sarah, I want to get very quickly to Yang Liang. Yang Liang, we've only got about a minute left. I mean, there's been a lot of talk recently, and we've heard these terms, decoupling, de-risking. Do you think after this summit that that threat is now receding, or does it still remain a challenge? Well, I think, to put it very shortly, I think it still remains to be a challenge. I think one thing that did not really get resolved or even just talk more positively about is this um, export ban on high tech and also the general tariffs. Um, and of course, uh, both sides did not really make any agreements on the joint efforts in you know, peacemaking in the Middle East either. So I think, you know, for the former, these trade relationships are still very much, uh, uh, you know, I think, not really normalized yet, um, and I think that's a lot of you know political obstacles that are they're preventing this from happening. But at the same time, I would say Janet Yellen has been calling for this for a long time, and very clearly that there's no decoupling. The U.S. is not aiming to decouple from China. But at the same time, I think this kind of technological competition is still very much in the way of a normalized, you know, trade and business relationships between the two countries. Right. So I think really the question for Biden and others is, you know, they all talk okay. about competition, but competition to what end, right? If the competition um, is not leading to yeah. a win-win solution, then this competition is probably not going to be very good. Okay, Yan Liang, we have, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. We are running out of time. Uh, time has caught up with us. It's been a great discussion. Thanks to all of you for being with us. CGTN will continue to bring you special coverage of the APEC meetings throughout the week, right here from San Francisco. Thanks for joining us. From sustainability and digitalization to trade, health, and energy security, 21 major Asian Pacific economies gather to address the most pressing global challenges and to create a future of sustainable economic growth. Join CGTN for our coverage of APEC 2023.